Father God, through your word. Bless your word to fall on good soil. Bless your word to become even more real to us. And bless us, Father God, to transport your word 
and to the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls will know your word, will hear your word, and obey your word. Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all on and all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Hallelujah to the Lamb. We have come into this house one more again to worship Him. Have you come to worship Him or you just came to watch worship? We've come tonight to worship Him. Amen. We've come to worship the conquering King of Calvary one more again. Well, in Acts chapter 9, verses 20 through 25, Acts chapter 9 in the, in, in the New Testament, verses 20 through 25. God has blessed us again. Amen? God has blessed us one more again to praise his name. Amen. Acts chapter 5, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, verses 20 through 25. We know that Saul was a part of the murdering crowd. Who was Saul murdering? Christians. Why would somebody murder Christians? Why would somebody even desire to murder Christians? Why was he murdering Christians? Judaism was the key religion during those days. And Saul believed that those who were not following Judaism, which was the, the message of the Jews, Saul believed that they should be killed. So Saul went about his business, pulling them even out of the synagogue, even out of the church, and he killed them. My, my, my. So Saul, Saul went about his daily activities and he was killing Christians on his way to Damascus to pull them out of the synagogue and to arrest them. Um, Jesus, the Christ, arrested him. Amen? Jesus arrested him. A bright light shone from heaven. And when this bright light shone, shone from heaven, Saul asked this question, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus the Christ, the one you persecute. Amen? So as he began to, to listen, and the Bible says that there were men with him, but Jesus wasn't talking to those men, was he? He was talking strictly to Saul. So it says to us, that when God wants our attention, he can get our attention even with other folk around. Amen? Amen? So that leads us up to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. Paul was blinded. Saul. Saul was blinded on this Damascus road. And as he was blinded on this Damascus road, uh, he was sent to Ananias. Ananias was reluctant. Why was Ananias reluctant to deal with Saul? He didn't want to be killed. So we got a murderer, a murderer of Christians. Ananias told by God, go and, and wait and Saul, you'll find Saul there and Saul is blind and I want you to go and lay hands on him. My, my, my. So Ananias were convicted, was convicted by God. He went ahead and did it. And the moment that he prayed for Saul, the something fell from his eyes like scales and he was able to see. He got up and he ate and he was strengthened. That ends out chapter 8. And the Bible says in chapter 8 of Acts, the last verse, the Bible says, oh, I'm, I'm not right. Chapter 9 of Acts, chapter 9, verse number 19 it says that he spent some time in Damascus with the brethren, with the disciples. So here it is, a man that was killing disciples. Now he's spending time with them. And even when Saul is praying with them, they're looking up. They, they, they're praying with their eyes open. 
they look inside eyes at Saul because this is the man that used to kill. Now he's talking about he's called a preacher. And not only is he called to preach, he's called to preach Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Let's look at verse number 20. Acts chapter 9, verse 20. Now he says he spends time in Damascus, and then verse 20 says, Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he, that Jesus, that the Christ, is the Son of God. Here he is, the murderer, those who murdered He's, he's one of the ones who murdered Christians, and now he's talking about Jesus the Christ. Now he's talking about the Son of the Most High God. Saul has come to the conclusion now that Jesus is the Son of God. That Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible says he didn't wait. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogue. Same place he was pulling people out of and killing them. Now he's going in there and preaching to them. It's like a terrorist coming in here and preaching to us. The same terrorist that killed Christians. Now this terrorist is, is preaching Jesus. And yes, he did flip the script. The Bible says that he was just as zealous for Christ as he was for Judaism. He was just as much on fire for Jesus as he was on fire against Christians. When a man meets Jesus, he can never, ever, ever be the same. When a man, woman, boy, or girl truly, truly meet Jesus, they can never be the same. A terrorist, a, a murderer. God can even change the murderer. Isn't that something? God can even change the terrorist. Acts chapter, Acts chapter, chapter nine, verse number twenty. It simply says to us that he started to preach Jesus, the Christ, as the Son of God. What an amazing transformation. Has God made an amazing transformation in your life? I know you didn't kill Christians, did you? Anybody? You didn't kill Christians, but, but you did not honor Christ at one time. Everybody? Because the Bible says we all have fallen short. We all have sinned. And we all are guilty. So therefore, if we don't follow Christ... We are against Christ. Immediately he preached Christ. Why does it say the Christ? Why do I always say Jesus the Christ? Preacher asked me that one day. Why do you always say Jesus the Christ? Because he is Jesus the Christ. Because <laughs> the word Christ means the anointed one. The anointed one. Not an anointed one. The anointed one. The word Christ means the Messiah, the long-awaiting Messiah. He is the only true Messiah that has come to deliver Israel. Therefore, he is Jesus the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus the Christ. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem? And has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. They began to question themselves and question each other. Is this not the same man that got a letter in chapter 8? <laughs> they got a letter in chapter 9 that bound people in chapter 8, bound people in chapter 9. That pull people out in the same chapter out of the church? They begin to question, is this not the same guy? And y'all want us to sit here and listen to him? I dare tell you, every single preacher has a story. It is not such a pretty story. 
But if God has changed him, God has changed him. That's why we we walk with them. We we talk with them. We allow them to minister to us. God deliver me from preachers who act like they've never gone through anything. People were amazed. People were blown away. People were just so distraught because now we're welcoming somebody in our church that's not churchy. That's anti-church. That's anti-Christ. But God changed them. The people who heard, they were amazed and they began to ask the question, is this not the one that used to destroy Christians? Is this not the one who used to talk against Christianity? Is this not the one who, who act like he hated us and now he's acting like he loved us? Could you trust that brother with life? Can you, could you have trusted him? Could you, could you, could you brother Miles, could you trust it? Saul? Remember, this is still Saul now. This is, this is the Saul that was consenting to Philip's death. This is the Saul that was pulling folk out the church. This is Saul that was killing them. This is the same Saul that got a letter from the high priest to go and take Christians out the church and kill them. Can you trust him, Brother Mount? Uh, from a distance. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sitting in the back of the church. <laughs> <laughs> you, you sit in the back by the front door. <laughs> so when he began his little antic, you just, you just dismiss it. <laughs> so he has to prove himself, right? And I think he has to prove himself to all of us. Because of how how spiritual we are. You know, it's kind of like if one of your friends do you wrong. And you know they're your friends. One of your family members do you wrong. And they're supposed to be your family members. And now they have been converted. You'll be just like these folk in Judaism watching them out the corner of their eyes. Yeah. Watching them praying, but you're praying, praying with your eyes open. When we used to do evangelism in Third Ward and uh, we would pray on the streets, we had a whole training session to tell people how to pray on the corner. We had a whole training session to tell them, be watchful, be mindful where you are. And now, and then, as well as now, as well as then, we even have to pray sometime with our eyes open in the church. Why is that? Watch your eyes closed, folks. Roaming around, trying, trying to pick up something. <laughs> trying to pick up something. Sister David can testify. $1,500 uh, camera, gone. Matter of fact, that's why we don't have altar call where you come to the altar anymore. Are you with me? The whole church is the altar now. We had altar call one Sunday when we were in the storefront. We had altar call. A phone came up missing. And it was a flip phone, but it was a valuable phone at that time. That same day, a $1,500 camera came up missing. $1,500 in 2000, 2005 is a lot of money. Yeah. It is why we were at the altar praying. Couldn't afford video cameras then. We were at the altar praying. And somebody, somebody that had sat among us decided they needed it more than we needed it. So yeah, you would have to watch. You would have to be careful. You would have to be alert. I always tell Sister Davis, when we get to the gas station, be alert. Don't be on your phone. Don't be writing on no paper. Don't, don't be doing your thing that you're going to do after we leave the gas station. Just for a moment, be alert. Because you know she's sitting there with the door open. If anything going on outside, I'm just out there. I'm just stuck like Chuck. She, I walk up to the car, pulling on the door, and I'm just stuck. She locked herself in and locked me out. <laughs> now, she's not alert. She doesn't know what's going on. She got, she got this busy schedule in her eyes. 
And everything is so disconcerting to her other than what's on the phone or what's on the paper. I could be out there crying, crawling, clawing on the paint, going down, and she'd be like, oh, she just, oh, just a good old girl having a good old time. You better hang on your own because I'm locked up in here. So these people were alert. They were alert. Is this not the same man that was killing folk in Jerusalem? He destroyed those who called on the same name. Now he's coming telling us he's talking about the same name. He's preaching about the same name. He's preaching about Christ. And in the same name, he killed folk who carried on this name. In Jerusalem. In the holy city. Now he come telling us that he is the son of God. He's the Christ. So you have to be alert. Have to be alert. Have to be alert. And he has come for this purpose. He said not only did he kill folk, he came for the self-same purpose of killing more folk. Isn't that something? Now y'all can go on trusting me if you want to. So we like I said, Pff. Kevin, you go down there and trust him if you want. They ain't doing that. So you have to make sure, you have to make sure that you are always alert. So they ask, he came here for this purpose, and now we're supposed to trust him just because he said that Jesus is the Son of God. He came for the same purpose of binding men, binding women. Binding children. He had no respect of person. He was an equal opportunity murderer. And now he's talking about Jesus. The son of God. Now he, he's got holy. It's kind of like some brothers that go to prison and come back. They, they hold it in. They, they got it. I'm not saying that these brothers are not saved. I'm just saying when they meet Jesus. They may have robbed, they may have killed, they may have raped, but when they meet Jesus, they come back and they think everybody ought to believe them. Brother Miles said, brother, you got to prove yourself. That's why when brothers come and join the church and sisters that come to visit the church, I say to them, don't walk in the church telling folk you've been to prison. Some of them listen. Some of them don't. Some of them listen and they just hold it until that time of testimony. There's a time of testimony. And let me tell you, when you first get out, that's not your time. Folk are not as holy as we think. Oh, hey girl, get your purse. Matter of fact, get your children, put all your children around you. There's a man with a record in the house. Yes? yes? Even the men looking at him like, hey, brothers, we got to get together, get a core group together. We got to watch that brother. Yes? So we have to get, get to a point where, yeah, we are alert, but we have to also understand that God does change men's hearts. God does change men's character. God does make a difference in people's lives. Because he made a difference in all our lives, right? That, that somebody said, but that doesn't even raise the fact that he came here for this same purpose of killing us. Now we got a murderer. Girl, we got a murderer that joined the church. When President Bush was governor, and we were doing, we were at the point where we, we were about to do a prison ministry at the caravan unit. And George W. Bush was the governor of Texas. He instituted a program where we could go and we could go in the prison and talk about Christ. And the caravans unit, the, the newspaper had it on the front page. Governor of Texas, singing Amazing Grace next to a killer, next to a murderer. So they zeroed in on that murderer and George W. Bush, and they put it on the front page. It said how hypocritical he is. 
He's seeing amazing grace standing next to a criminal. And he wants all of us to accept it. And that was the beginning of a ministry in prison for the state of Texas that was ordained by the state through the state government. So that was the way that I had the opportunity to go to the caravans unit and spend seven years ministering there. Because George W. Bush took a chance and saw amazing grace standing next to a murderer. Now the whole caption just focused on those two men. There are a lot more people there than George Bush and the murderer. Matter of fact, there were a lot of murderers there, but they had looked up the data. They pointed out that just that one guy. There were burglars, burglars there, there were murderers there, there were people that were rapists there, but Bush was standing next to a murderer. And he wants us to accept it. That's how it is in real time today. I remember when we used to have the exchange, inter interfaith exchange ministry from the caravan unit, we used to have the prisoners that used to come and sing for us. And they were all dressed in white. And there was always a guard at this door and a guard at that door. And they were dressed in white. And these brothers could really sing and they could really play instruments. And man, when they first came, the first time, the whole church was unnerved. I mean, the whole church was like, oh Lord, Pastor David has lost his mind. I knew I should have left with that other group. He has lost it. Now, we didn't have a problem as long as he was going to the prison. But now he's brought the prison to us and the prisoners. Lost his mind. Matter of fact, he must be an ex-prisoner himself. We need to look up his record. But God changes people. God delivers people. God can change even your heart. You can leave home tonight thinking about going somewhere and doing one thing. But when God gets next to your heart, he can change your heart. And he can change other people's heart. So it says that this is a guy that left Jerusalem. He came here to Damascus. He's pulling folk out of church. He's killing them. He even has a certificate from the priest to do these things. And now we are accepting him in our church. Verse 22. Acts chapter 9, verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength. Back in, in, in Acts chapter 9, it says that he, he ate and he increased in strength. He was strengthened through food. That's, that's chapter 9, verse 19. He was strengthened through food. Now this word strengthened means he was strengthened through the Spirit of God. You have to be physically strengthened, yes. But you need to be spiritually strengthened also. All of us who are in church, we have not arrived yet. The moment God is through with you, you have breathed your last breath. The moment God is finished with you, you will not be able to do anything. As long as you're living, you're able to do some things for God because you are being strengthened. I hope you are. You are being strengthened daily through the word of God, through hearing what God has to say. He confounded the Jews who dwell in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. He was strengthened. They complained. He was strengthened. They looked at him crazy, he was strengthened. They doubted him, he was strengthened. He was strengthened so much so, until like Brother Miles says, he was proving himself until he confounded them. He confused them. He amazed them. They were so devastated when he showed up. But as they continued to watch his character, hear his word, and to see him walking in the same word, then they were confounded. It's like, really? 
This man is the real deal. Have you noticed the growth of some people in our church? Have you noticed people going from, from one point in their life to the other? God is able to do that. Have you noticed how, how people have started to show more maturity in the Lord? Only God can do that. And you have to spend time with God in order to do it. You can't just, just exist. You have to spend quality time with God in order to be strengthened spiritually. Now, most of us have no problem with being strengthened physically. We just eat, we exercise, we sleep, we're strengthened physically. But we have to be strengthened spiritually. Why do you think we're reading the Bible? Why do you think we're studying the Bible? Why do you think we're in Sunday school, we're in Bible study? Why do we, you think that we have quality, quiet time with the Lord? It is so we will be strengthened. I told you before, the devil loves weak people. The devil didn't want to work hard. I was coming back from Mississippi. I was driving in my, my, my little mini yellow uh, Dodge Dakota pickup truck. And I was on my CV. I mean, it was yellow. I don't know if Brother Miles remember. I had a yellow Dodge Dakota pickup truck with five, shift, five gears in it. Manual clutch. I got up to good speed on Highway I-10. I got up to good speed. And I was coming through this little small town, Denham Springs. I was coming through Denham Springs. And I could hear the, C the guys on the CB saying, there's a bear on the ground. There's a bear on the ground. By the time I clutched down from five to four, the bear was behind me. And the bear had yellow, red, and blue lights. The bear pulled me over. And the bear got out and he said, sign right here. And I didn't bother the bear. I didn't argue with the bear. I just signed right there. But all I had to do is clutch down just two minutes prior to that. When I first heard them say, there's a bear on the ground. But I figured the bear was further down the road. And out of nowhere, the bear showed up. And let me tell you, when you're on I-10, when you're on a freeway, it's easy to go over 10 miles an hour. And that bear gives you a bear-sized ticket. No sense of me arguing with him. No sense of me trying to take defensive driving. No sense of me going back down there to court. Just pay the bail. Just, just, just pay. If they'll let you do defensive driving, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you plead no contest and get it over with. And you just have to make sure that you obey the laws of the way. Saul was obeying the laws of the land, but he was killing people. He was hurting people. Now, I don't know why killing was considered all right. Killing anybody then and now should not have been all right. For any reason, should not have been all right. Now, we got a thing out here where Bunch of guys decided they're going to jump on one guy and then out of the woodworks came dressed up. You see, some people are like a pack of wolves. And they don't mind hurting you and they get emboldened when they travel in a pack. I saw it growing up. I mean, as long as they're in a pack, they are emboldened. They're going to attack you and get in your face and demand that you do what they say. But when... The, the rest of them show up. You even had women who got bold. They, they bold enough to throw sucker point. I said, man, all that water out there, they haven't thrown anybody in the water yet. By the time I thought that, then there she go. Blowing bubbles. That's why I always say, if you are not strengthened, if you are, are not strong enough, don't get in a, in a gunfight with a knife. They thought, oh, it's just one man. And since it's just one man, let's do what we do. This is what we do. This is 
what Trump empowered us to do. Let's just do what we do. But thank God for backup. Now there are some preachers that said, hey, look, don't, don't use the chair, use the cross. This preacher saying, you can't overtake a strong man's house until you bind a strong man. And I'm saying, when the pack of wolves show up, show up, they, they become as lions when other wolves show up. I guess I'm not spiritual enough, Brother Miles. I just, I guess I haven't met Jesus long enough. I guess I haven't been saved enough. But I just believe, I, this is just my personal belief, I just believe that we need to, to level the playing field. And the moment we level the playing field, everybody wants to say, oh man, I didn't mean that. Oh yeah, you did. You participated. And since you participate, we're going to participate. Dad always said, he said this, he said, don't ever start anything. But don't come home if you don't finish it. So that just wrecked my whole thinking, you know. Over here, mama saying, just show love. Dad said, you better not darken that door. <laughs> Don't ever start anything. But you better finish it. Am I wrong for rejoicing with what I saw? I mean, I was like a cheerleader on the sideline. I guess this is confession night. I, I was like a cheerleader on the sideline. Yes, Lord. I mean, I got spiritual. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. It's like when you are at disadvantage, the devil will always try to kick you while he's down. Six, seven people on top of one man. But when one brother showed up, they got, they was like, hmm, let's rethink this thing. Oh, baby, it's too late now. <laughs> We, we D-O-N dog. We Mississippi dog. <laughs> we dog. So here Paul is. He's killing Christians. And now he wants people to believe he's saved. So I want people to believe that they're going to hear him talk about Jesus. And yeah, we got to watch this brother for a while. But they were amazed at the fact that he was consistent. The problem with Christians in the 21st century is that we are not consistent enough. If women want their husbands to come to church, the women have to be consistent. If men want women to respect them, as the Bible says, honor your husband, men have to be consistently walking with God. If they don't see you consistent, why, they, why would they follow you? If they don't see that you have a love for God and that you're going to sacrifice for God, why would they follow you? Because when the chips are down, they have to see you and have to make sure that they see you in a light that you're going to stand for God regardless. They got to see that you, I mean, in sickness, you're going to stand with God. And in health, you're going to stand with God. In poor, you're going to stand with God. In rich, you're going to stand with God. The question now is, who won it in Florida? And the other question is, will he or she continue to stand with God? Or will they begin to stand with God? Because, you know, it takes money to sin. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? Some sin, you got to have money to do. The reason why some of us are not sinning so much is because we ain't got the money to do it. It takes money to do some sin. We talk about blue collar sin and white collar sin. The reason why we're not engaging in white collar sin is because number one, we ain't been taught how to do it. Number two, we don't get our hands on enough money to do it. But we go to prison for years even for little bitty sins. Little bitty thefts. Less than a million dollars. When you got a man that says, I pay $750 worth of taxes a year, and I'm a multi-millionaire. No, have mercy. So Paul, Paul confounded them. Paul, 
all confounded the Jews. And the, the Jews that was dwelling in Damascus believed the word had gotten there. <laughs> Y'all entertain the man. It's just like somebody joins a new church. And the word get there the moment somebody hear about it. Girl, y'all got him over there? And don't let it be a preacher. Girl, y'all elected him? Y'all let that man preach in y'all pulpit? Girl, let me tell you. A man you don't know the half. Paul is consistently proving that Jesus is the Christ. Paul, Saul at this point, Saul is continually proving that he trusts Jesus as his Savior. Are you consistent enough for people to see Jesus in you? Are you consistent enough? Or do people see you as a fair weather Christian? When the sun is shining, and now we can't talk about the sun shining because now it's too hot. So are you consistent when it's too hot? Are you consistent when it's raining? Are you consistent if that 20 year snow falls? Are you consistent when it's, it's dark outside? I've, I've, I've seen people who can trust God enough to go anywhere at night, but they can't trust God enough to go to church at night. Let me tell you, all these churches that used to have evening services, I didn't say afternoon service. The churches that used to have evening service, you might as well keep the air off and keep the door closed now. Am I right? I mean, the evening services, I didn't say afternoon services. Evening is 6.30 p.m. All the churches that used to have evening services, they really in a bind right now. They used to have services like Usher's Day. BTU. They used to have Deacon's Day. They used to have Quad Day. Some churches had 12 evening services a year. And they used to have the Lord's Supper every first Sunday. And they were determined to only have it at night. So, if it was the Lord's Supper, is that right? Supper. Supper. Lord's Supper. Supper. If it was the Lord's Supper, if it was the Lord's Supper, if it was the Lord's Dinner, if it was the Lord's Dinner, why is it when COVID came, we no longer had the Lord's Dinner? Now we had Lord's Brunch. As often as we do it, we show forth his death and his suffering until he comes again. Somebody explain to me what I'm talking about when I say every church that, that believed that it was the Lord's Supper. Why am I using that? Who wants to talk to me? The Lord's Supper. Yes, ma'am. There's always a person that look around. Why am I using, why am I stressing the Lord's Supper or Lord's Dinner? They used to have it at night, right? And they had convictions that it has to be done at night. One pastor decided, now he was, he was convicted that, that he had to have it at night. So what he did was he said, the spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And in the morning service, he said, God has shown me that somebody in the room is not going to make it back tonight. So we're going to do communion today because someone in the room is not going to make it back tonight. Somebody is not going to make it back. Six o'clock came, the pastor hadn't shown up yet. Six thirty came, the pastor hadn't shown up yet. Somebody left the church, went to the pastor's house, and the pastor was dead. Truly God has spoken to him. And he was convinced that somebody wasn't going to make it home, make it back to church tonight from home, but he didn't know it was him. Did God honor that last communion? 
We have to understand that Jesus is Jesus regardless. The Sabbath is made for the man, not the man for the Sabbath. Days are made for men to worship God, and we cannot worship the day. There are churches that have church on Saturday, Saturday nights, and they also have it on Sunday. They do that because they can. They need everybody to be in church, so they make concessions for people who work. Are they wrong for having it on Saturday? You know, the Sabbath is Saturday, right? Sunday is the first day of the week. We as Christians believe that Sunday is the first day of the week. And the reason why we, we celebrate Christ is because he got up early that third day morning, which is a Sunday. Sergeants kept increasing all the more in spiritual strength. He, he confounded the Jews who dwelt at Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Why did they say Jesus is the Christ? If Jesus is dead, why didn't they say Jesus was the Christ? Why didn't they say Jesus is the Christ? Anybody? Because he's still alive. One thing that really changed my mind was a sermon when I went to the youth revival when I first came to Houston. I was already saved. I already loved the Lord. I was working in, in youth uh, discipleship ministry. So our youth discipleship ministry known as Young Women for Christ and Young Men for Christ. We went over to that time. It was called Antioch, which is Southeast Baptist Church now. We went over to Antioch over off Scott and Airport. We went over to Antioch and Pastor Ralph West was preaching. And I was struggling in my faith. And he closed this sermon out by saying, I know that Jesus lives. And he says, the reason why I know Jesus lives is because I can see the sun move from the eastern hemisphere to the western hemisphere, and it does it over and over again. Therefore, I know Jesus lives. He said, the reason why I know Jesus lives is because when I come to church and I see the saints of God celebrating him, clapping to him, rejoicing for him, and praising him, it reminds me that Jesus lives. And he said, finally, I know that Jesus lives when I look over the shoulder of my life and I see how far God has brought me. I know that Jesus lives. That sermon, that close, changed my entire look on life. Already saved, already loved the Lord, already operating in ministry, already making sacrifices for God. But that one picture that he painted in that youth revival blew me away. Changed my whole perspective of life. I know that Jesus lives because when I look over the shoulder of my life and I see where God has brought me, I can testify now. He lives. He lives within me. I know he lives. So this Jesus that he talks about, he says, Jesus is the Christ because he yet lives. Verses 21 through 25. 23 through 25. Now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. Check this out. Here it is, one of their teammates that used to kill Christians. Now the Jews are plotting to kill him. He started talking about Jesus. Now they're plotting to kill him. The same Saul that, that tried to, that supported, rather, that supported the death of Stephen, now he's on the run. Let me tell you, what goes around, it comes around. The same Saul that held the men's coats that killed Stephen, that stoned Stephen, now he got to run for his life. And the same people he joined in with, the Jews who were Judaizers, the Jews who was following Judaism, the Jews back in Jerusalem, and the Jews that supported him in Damascus, now they after him. Criminals always turn on each other. 
criminals, they gonna, they gonna let you down. That's why when they when they do an interrogation and they get two criminals, they separate. And they tell this one, your buddy just told us that you were the shooter. Then they tell this one, your buddy just sold you out. He said you were the shoot, shooter. Now both of them start singing like birds. So they only get the truth when they separate. But criminals will always turn each other in. You know when they say there's still one at large but we have two of them? I always say by in the morning. Those two will work the plea bargain. They say, well, we won't give you the death penalty, but we'll give you life in prison if you just tell us who the other man was. I mean, they sing like a bird. Criminals will always turn criminals in. It happened with Saul. Saul killing Christians, and now they try to kill him. Verse 24. But their, their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gates day and night to kill him. They watched the entrance in the exit. They didn't want to kill him. But the way the city was made is they had a big hole like a window with no screens over. The, the gates, the, the walls had big holes in it. You know when the Bible says that it would be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven? He's not talking about an eye of a sewing needle. He's talking a hole in the wall where the camel used to have to, the, the, the rider of the camel used to have to unpack the camel. The camel would have to get down and bend his knees and then squeeze in. And then once he get on the other side, they repack the camel. So this wall had holes in it. When Saul found out that they were ready to kill him, he's on the run now. Then the disciples took him by night. These people watching for him day and night. We're going to get you, Saul. You have betrayed us. And that's what gang members do. They, you, you turn us in. You betrayed us. You're no longer gang member of ours. We're going to get you. They watched the gates day and night. Then the disciples, the disciples here are talking about the Christians in Damascus. The disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall. They let him down through the wall in a large basket. This basket was something that would carry a bunch of stuff in. And it was not unusual for men to let down the basket and bring the basket back up because whenever you're on the second, third, fourth, fifth floor, you would use a basket to pull stuff up. So it wasn't unusual to let the basket down day or night. But this situation was Saul was in the basket. They let Saul down through the, through the hole in the wall. They let him down in the basket. I want to tell you, when you're working for the Lord, God will find a way out. You remember the spies? You remember the spies when they were looking for a way out? God will even use the unsaved. God will use anything and anybody to save his own. He even used a liar to save the children of Israel. God can use people's lies just for your benefit. I didn't say you need to lie. I said that God will use even the unsaved to rescue you. And here God is using saved people to save Paul. Saul. You got to remember, he's Saul. He's still Saul. He's still Saul. He's a new person. He's different. He is preaching Jesus. Let me tell you, Saul was a bad man. But God saves even bad men. It says to us tonight, that even though our lives may be upside down, even though our lives may be torn up, even though our lives may be in shambles, God still can reach us. God still can bless us. 
God still can save us. And God is willing to deliver us. Regardless of where you've been, regardless of who you are, regardless of what you've gone through, God is waiting for you to reach out to him so he can deliver you. He's God. The message tonight is God rescued us through Jesus. He died on Calvary. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And he rose from the dead. And even in the 21st century tonight, if you can just trust the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, you can be saved right here, right now. The piano doesn't have to play. The organ doesn't have to play. The choir doesn't have to sing. You can be saved right here, right now, if you just give your heart to Jesus Christ. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Will you come to Jesus? Will you confess him as Christ? Will you confess him as the Messiah? Will you confess him as the Son of God? If you would receive Jesus today, just join me in prayer. In this little simple prayer, just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Lord, thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, trusting Jesus as your Savior, you are now born again. We believe that you are saved. You're on your way to heaven. Now trust God enough. To get involved in a spirit-filled church, a Bible teaching church, and work out your selfish. If you're looking for a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church at 4251 Shiramai Road, Houston, Texas, 77048 USA. Please join us again for Bible study on Wednesday night at 7:15 p.m. Join us on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock a.m. for Sunday school. And join us on Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. for worship service. Thank you so much for being a part of our service. It is offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gift. It's time to give to the Lord. We thank God for this privilege this honor of giving unto him. Father God, we come praying now that you bless us as we come to give. Bless our lives. We thank you for money, income, increase. We thank you, Father God, for finances. Bless every giver. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to give electronically, you can give by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing it to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Let us remember um, on Saturday evening at 5 p.m. we have our coming night of laughter at 7 p.m. this Saturday, our comedy show, a night of laughter. We want to make sure that we come and hear Black Prince, a Christian comedian that will be here. 
This is a fundraiser for our youth and our young people to go on domestic missions. The admission is free, but we will have an offering that will be received as a fundraiser for our youth for domestic missions. That's this Saturday, August the 12th at 5 p.m. I got that mixed up. 6.30 p.m., 6.30 p.m., August 12th at 6.30 p.m. this Saturday. And then Sunday at 5 p.m., we'll be giving honor to the late J.R. Richard, J.R. Richard, uh, J.R. Richard is what he's known, Jane Rodney Richard, the great hard pitcher from the Houston Astros. We will be celebrating and giving honor to the late J.R. Richard um, this Sunday here at the New Beginning Church at 5 p.m. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please remember tonight and Sunday are our last opportunities to give to our back to school supply drive for the tornado victims in Mississippi. I've chosen Silver City, Mississippi. Please, if you haven't brought them tonight, bring, bring school supplies for these victims and their children, and we will deliver them next week. And so, please, ma'am, please, sir, participate in the back to school drive. We want to teach our young people how to give to those who are less fortunate than they are. Also, we are still doing our Bible listening. Please continue to do your Bible listening and your Bible journaling so that we can be strengthened through the word of God. Let us stand to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to hear your word, to obey your word, and to deliver your word. We pray, Father God, that your word become more real to us and bless us that we will reach other men, women, boys, and girls by way of your word. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live as well as Zoom. God bless you and God keep you is our